everybody. Steve Gunn with Handbooks coming at you with Friar Anthony of the Marion Friars Minor Order in Kentucky to talk about St. Francis of Assisi. You've probably heard the guy once or twice in your life, but uh, Friar is a Franciscan, so he's going to talk about the life of sin and his conversion story. Friar, welcome. Hi, Maria. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the order, please? Yeah, so um, it's, it, I'm here in, in Covington, the Covington Diocese here in Kentucky. Uh, Bishop Roger J. Foy, he, he, he invited me to come speak to him, and um, we just decided to, to try to start this, this up. So it's still, it's still a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a traditional Franciscan reform. And you get a lot of Franciscan reforms, especially here in America, but they, they kind of deal a bit more with things that are, I don't know, kind of the sen sensational aspects of what we think St. Francis is about instead of the traditional Franciscanism that's been handed down through the years, um, really focusing on kind of the, uh, the liturgical aspect of Franciscan life, which is the Roman rite, but, but just it's a life of prayer, poverty, and penance. Uh, and so that's, that's that, Franciscanism. Just, we live, we live, we pray. And uh, from that, we have an apostolate that basically is on demand, depending on uh, the ways in which, you know, we're led through the prayer life. So. And uh, I'll link this order below. It's already linked up the website so you can check out more info on their order and vocations. If any young men are aspiring to be a Franciscan and want to the rigors of the order, because it's not for, how would you say, little boys, right? Yeah, you get you get grown you, men in their twenties, you know, twenty twenty five, and um, sometimes they'll they'll get teary in the morning after their first night here. <laughs> <laughs> Help them realize it's really not that bad. You get used to it, but you know, people aren't used to sleeping on boards and when it's really cold in the house all the time, and, you know, things like that. But actually, after they get used to it, they they realize it's very it's, it's quite beautiful to to live to live that way. So. So St. Francis, his life of sin, uh, why, did, why did you want to go with that title at the top? Well, people, there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, I can't go into everything about St. Francis today. That, that's just one aspect to, to look at when you start looking at St. Francis. Um, he's been, per, he, they perverted who he is in, in recent times. I may have said that when we spoke last time about manliness or something, but what, what they did with St. Francis is they, they started to focus on different aspects of him to give us basically a different St. Francis than, than, we, than we actually know. So St. Saint, Saint Francis referred to himself as, when he would talk about his past life, he would say, when I was in sin, you know, my life of sin. Now to understand it in some way, that's just what monastics would say back then. That's what people said when, when they left when they left the life that they had before, they left their life of sin. I'll go into what that means, but, but with St. Francis, well, actually, they made, they made some movies. I think Ignatius Press put one of them out. It was made by somebody else, but they, they, they put it out, put a little booklet with it, and they talk about St. Francis' life. But in that, in the first part, they always show his life when he was, you know, uh, Francis uh, Baradone, you know, the son of Pietro Baradone, and he was, you know, the, the, the merrymaker that would run around town and whatever else. But they show him as somebody that wasn't pure. They show him as somebody who committed grave sin. And then if you see new authors today who talk about St. Francis, they'll talk about the fact that he lived in grave sin. He probably committed. What they're doing is they're taking this, this, this wonderful young soul who wasn't living a religious life before his conversion, but he was living a very pure life a very pure life, they take it, they, they pervert him in a way, so he, he looks more like we do today. That's what happens with St. Francis quite often. Uh, but, but the testimony of the companion, so there's all kinds of different writings of St. Uh, there's those who knew St. Francis, and one of them is called the Companions. It was some of his first companions. Some of the stories get written down and passed down to us from there. But, but they refer to the, the fact that St. Francis, uh, he, he, he lived a very, he was a very pure youth. Now back then, of course you had people that were grave sinners and things like that. And, uh, but, but still Christ was at the center of, 
of the medieval culture. They, they push off on us at school that, that um, the medieval culture was a backward, dark culture and whatever else. But it was, it was like the height of Christianity. Pe- people back then, a common Catholic knew the Psalms by heart and they would just sing them and things, you know, when they were going to do the wash down at the, you know, back you know, in Italy, a place like that, they have a place where the water comes down. You'd actually all go to the same place. You'd wash your clothes there and things like that. People on their way back and forth, they'd be singing and whatever else, the, the Psalms. It was a normal thing back then. The culture wasn't perfect. And that's one of the reasons God called St. Francis to that time period is because things actually were starting to look a lot like the way we have life today with the luxury and things like that. Well, St. Francis grew up in a very wealthy family. And in growing up in this family, uh, you know, his, his, they weren't noble, but they, they, had, they had quite a bit of luxury. They, they had the things that they needed. Um, St. Francis wore, they, they say, rich and costly garments. Um, and as he got older, he became the king of the youth, they called him, the king of the youth. They actually put a scepter in his hand, a crown on his head, and he would march them through the streets. Uh, now, anybody who's been to Assisi, they're tiny streets. And if you're singing in the middle of these streets, it, it would just echo into all the houses. Well, in the middle of the night, they'd be marching through the streets with St. Francis with a scepter in his hand. A scepter is like a little you know, thing you hold in your hand to, to show that, you're, that you have the authority. And they would place, the youth would place their authority in St. Francis to be their leader in revelry. But revelry, not necessarily in, in a way where what they were doing was very sinful, but they were, they were, they were jovial. They, 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 they were, they were living kind of an extravagant way because he was, he had very little care about money, even before his conversion. So he was rich and his dad was rich and he was the direct heir of his dad's wealth, which meant that he, what, he, what belonged to his dad belonged to him. And so he would just, they said he would pour money out like water. So of course, all the kids in the town love St. You know, Francis, because he would take them out and they would, they would all go out and they would have a party and he would, they would have this lavish banquet and he would spend, he would, he would, he would spend uh, the money on the whole thing. And then they would go across town singing and whatever else. And, you know, he was a fun person to be around. They said that his personality was irresistible. He had a deal about him. He had something that was irresistible about him. It was just part of his personality. But this doesn't mean that he was going around and compromising his baptismal promise. That doesn't mean that. Even when he refers to his life as sin, what he's referring to, he's referring to a life that was before his conversion. You know, the definition for sin is um, adversio ad Deo and conversio ad creaturum. So turning away from God and turning towards the creature, that is the definition of sin. So conversion would be the opposite, wouldn't it? It would be the turning away from the creature and turning back to God. So if we want to think about our life, we all, all of us, many of us are, are cradle Catholics, as we like to say. But we grow up not understanding how important the faith is. Most of us didn't receive a very good catechesis. We, we didn't go to a liturgy that taught us anything at all. Some of us didn't even know where the tabernacle was in the church. I remember when I was a boy, my mom would walk past this closet all the time and make a genuflection. I was like, what are you doing? I, I never understood what she was doing. And she, she, she would say, our Lord's in there. I'm like, why is our Lord in the closet? So it wasn't really until I got older years later that I realized. So we, we've all been in kind of these situations where little by little the faith comes to us. And then once we really start to understand it, something happens and there's a conversion. I remember when I was a young friar, I would write home to my mom and using the words of St. Maximilian Colby, I would say, pray for my conversion. And then she wrote me back and just was like, is everything okay? <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything's, everything's fine. But, but we always have to have this conversion where we're turning away from the creature and we're turned back to God. It's a constant thing. It's a constant thing until you're completely detached from the creature. You're no longer, it's what our Lord says, unless you hate your mother and your father and your, you know, your, your, your lands and everything else, and even your own life, you can't have anything to do with me. The conversion is detaching ourselves and, and turning ourselves away from all that is of the world and of worldliness. So that's what we can put on St. Francis is his conversion is from away from world 
worldliness and towards godliness. Everything that was worldly for him was sin. Not because it was actually like mortal sin. He had to go to confession for it. They insist the early, the early companions, like I said, that they insist on his, that he never violated his conscience. Most likely St. Francis never lost his baptismal promise because he was a very noble youth. In his youth, even though he was the king of revelry, leading youth through the streets and spilling money everywhere for everybody to have, have a good banquet and do whatever else they did. They said that he would never exchange an ill word. If people started speaking in offensive terms or whatever, he would just stay silent. That's virtuous. It's very virtuous. He had a noble character to where, you know, even when his dad told him to go outside and there was a guy begging for money and his dad told him to, to send him off. St. Francis ran outside and said, get out of here. What do you, he sent him off. But as soon as St. Francis went back into the business, his heart broke thinking, Oh, I better run back after him. So just, this is when he's still a youth in the world. He runs back after him to, to give him something. Mm-hmm. And that his dad didn't want him doing that, but he had this noble heart. He knew that, you know, we're, we're not to treat people badly like that, though he would do it if he were told to, but he would immediately repent and go run after the person and uh, want to give them anything that they needed. So that led St. Francis or another aspect that we see in St. Francis from that noble character, St. Francis was, it was like a step towards knighthood. He wanted to become a knight. He wanted to become more noble. You know, then you had a class system. So they were, they were, they were merchants and they wanted, he wanted to become noble. He wanted to become a knight. But you saw there was a zeal that he had. It was a zeal to risk life and limb for the adventures of war, for, the, for something noble, to do something noble. Noble, and then you find him. You find him in Perugia, where they had a feud between Perugia and Assisi. Perugia is just the city, just right, right over you know, the valley to the the other side. And there was a, and they were probably wrong. Assisi was probably wrong in this whole thing. But Saint Francis says no. He just jumps in there to defend his city by attacking another city. They found in his character he was just a normal soldier, but they found in his character something so noble, so so chivalrous. Even his captors, they say put him in prison with the knights for a whole year. For a whole year, he was in prison with the knights, but he didn't go with the normal soldiers. He went with the knights. And you see something in his, this noble character, St. Francis, that where he was able to, though they were in a dungeon probably for one year, it was a difficult situation. They would get beaten often. They didn't get fed well. It was cold and damp. It was a whole year uh, that they were in this prison and treated probably like dogs, they said that St. Francis never lost his sense of humor. He would actually always uh, make jokes about the, the difficult situation they were in, and he always tried to keep everybody's, um, you know, the tension on higher things. And at one point, they'd been in jail for a long time, or in prison for a long time, and, and they, they started to scold him for, for being jovial all the time. And what he said was, I will be very great, and the whole world will bow down to me. He, was, he already knew there was something. He was striving for something that was great, but he was still in that what he would call the life of sin, where he hadn't arrived yet at understanding how he was going to arrive at that, that uh, doing something great where the whole world would bow down to him, because he was right in the end. So the difference is that life of sin and that life of conversion. And I, the reason I think it's important to, to talk about this is the popes, especially Innocent the, the 11th, um, Leo the 13th, and Benedict the 15th, they all talk a lot about St. Francis, and they insist that everybody imitate St. Francis. Just as St. Paul said, be imitators of me, because St. Paul knew that he was imitating Christ uh, worthily. So the popes tell us, imitate St. Francis, because Christ stamped in his body the stigmata as a stamp of approval that St. Francis had imitated and transformed, been trans- allowed himself to be transformed into Christ and Christ crucified. And that's exactly what we're supposed to become transformed into. Not, not Christ, the one who was, was brought into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey with everybody saying Hosanna in the highest and laying their jackets down so you can walk them. That's, that's what we all want from, 
to be, we want to be like Jesus in that way. We want everybody to bow down to us in that way. And we want the glory of being, being seen as a servant of Christ because, no, no, Christ tells us to pick up our cross and follow him. Christ tells us unless we're dead to the world and even our own lives that we can't have anything to do with him. And this St. Francis saw, he saw that, he saw that Christ came into the world and took the lowest place. So St. Francis, when he started going through this struggle, this vocational crisis, you could say, and this is what youth, everybody goes through this today. They're trying to sort out, what am I supposed to do? Then they go through the mystical discernment. Everybody goes through the mystical discernment on what they're supposed to do with their life. Well, St. Francis he kept thinking, well, I'm supposed to be a knight. I'm supposed to go down and do these chivalrous things because he felt something huge in his heart that he had to do. But every time he would buy a new suit of armor and he'd get on a horse and go gallivanting towards like Campania where he was going to, in Puglia, where he's going to fight another war with somebody and become a knight and whatever else, our Lord would call him back and say, who, who are you wanting to serve? Do, do you want to serve the servant or do you want to serve the Lord? Lord meaning the master. He would say, well, I want to serve the master. I want to serve the Lord. Well, then go back to Assisi. So he just bought all this stuff, and he, he left, and the whole town comes out to see him, and they're cheering and thinking, you know, go, Francis. You're going to save. You're going to make a name for yourself. And then he comes right back, sold his horse, sold the armor, comes walking back. I mean, this kid just looked like a disaster afterwards. He's a lunatic. He gets out of prison. He, then he starts gallivanting, buying armor, selling the armor. I mean, make up your mind. What do you want to do? So he's trying to sort out what he wants to do, and he arrives after a long period being in prison. That's a long period of difficulty. Then he had a sickness, long period of sickness. This started to change St. Francis. He was still jovial, but not in the same way. There was a seriousness. A seriousness started to overtake him. And then he received a dream, and in that dream he saw this house with armor. Everybody knows the story. I think about this. And he knew he was he he again. You know, he wanted to enter into that. So at, during, this, during this time where he was sick, his friends started to ask him, started to see a change in him. And they thought maybe he'd found a woman. And he says, oh, yes, I found a bride. I found a bride that will surpass all other brides. And, um, and finally, when that got synthesized, he started to understand a bit better what it, that bride was, the life of Christ. And that's where the poverty comes in, the life of Christ. But I think the reason why it's important for us to look at that, why we look at St. Francis in this life of sin and this life of conversion is because we can apply it to us. Our life of sin and our life of conversion, many of us, after we convert and we try to start living on the road um, to, to sanctity, hopefully, though I, I think many people don't really strive for sanctity, they just think they're becoming holy and they want to leave it at that because striving for sanctity is heroic, heroically doing something where you're dying every day. And that means facing pain and discomfort and suffering. That's what real conversion means towards sanctity. But what we can, what we can look at is when we start to make that conversion, at least the very first step that we can make is we see that our life, the past life that we had even if it wasn't full of sin, but most of us, it was full of sin. We look at that as a life of, we call that the life of sin. And we segregate that from this new life that we want in Christ. Meaning we don't still go back every once in a while and revel. We revel in the fact that we used to do this or that. And then we converted. No, no, we become dead to that. St. Francis, though he probably never committed a mortal sin, he went blind because he wept over his past sins for the rest of his life. He wept just by thinking about the crucifixion and death of Christ because it, before, before St. Francis received the stigmata in his flesh, he received it in his heart, in his soul. And what it was, that stigmata was, it convicted him of his life of sin. That means his past life, his life before, his life before his life of grace in the Lord, uh, meaning his conversion, his, his vocation. And so, um, speaking of vocation, he, why didn't he become a priest? Why didn't he become a priest? Why well, didn't become a priest out of humility? But all the friars. This is another. This is another point on the Franciscans that 
they try to say that all the friars, they were just these simple poor men that wanted to work and whatever. So that we've gotten the whole order wrong nowadays. And actually, the Franciscan order is a clerical order. We went to Innocent III. Um, Innocent III made them clerics. They had the tonsure. St. Francis became a deacon so he could preach. And the other friars were also clerics of some sort. I mean, they, were, they entered into minor orders in some way, so they could also preach. Later, and not that far uh, afterwards, and it was a little bit after the, uh, the Lateran Council, the Fourth Lateran Council, I think they made another decision where it, it was really for priests to be preaching, in, in, uh, or maybe deacons might have been on there. I can't remember right now how that worked. But other clerics really didn't go out and preach anymore. Uh, so it had already changed within a few years where they didn't have these, you know, the simple lay brothers weren't really going out and just preaching in the squares. But in the beginning they were because that and Innocent III told them to go out and preach penance. And so that's what they did. So St. Francis didn't want to become a priest out of humility. Um, in fact, if you look, a lot of the great founders, none of them were ever priests. The great, the great founders of the great orders, not the more clerical orders that started, you know, after, after the Council of Trent, some of these... But, you know, that some people I was even told that the Benedictines looks like uh, they're not they're just not sure. It seems like St. Benedict was probably a priest, but they said they really just don't know. in the end. so that was very interesting. Uh, but but anyways, so it, it seems like he didn't become for that reason. Um, but for the reason of uh, the minore, he wanted to be the least of everyone. And that because that's that's to be like Christ is to be the least. Isn't that what they, uh, when he died, the, uh, the angels couldn't distinguish between him and Christ? Well, that was St. Clair. Well, that was St. Clair. Okay. That was St. Clair. When St. Clair, when St. Clair, well, that might have happened with St. Francis. I've never heard that, though. But what, what happened with St. Clair when she was dying, um, and this is what you see, the beautiful thing between St. Clair and you, of St. Francis. St. Francis was the perfect image of Christ, and St. Clair was the perfect image of the Blessed Virgin. And there was kind of like a, uh, it was a pure spousal ship, but there was kind of like an spousal ship in poverty between Claire and Francis because they were, they were very much of the same soul. So Claire, when she went to die, when she was dying, the sisters saw Our Lady there kind of coming down over top of St. Claire until you couldn't tell between one and the other. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, how, that's how transformed she became in the Blessed Virgin. Oh, wow. It's a beautiful thing. Yes, yes. All right, uh, back to Francis' con uh, conversion of the life of sin. Oh, so, so I, think, I think it's just to make that, to make that comparison, you know, that um, no matter how we've lived in our past, we want to we make a separation between a life in the world and a life that's constantly growing more and more towards God. We don't just make a conversion, start listening to a lot of talks on census fidelium, which is good, which is good, it's a good thing. And then, and then just say we're on the right road and now start saying that other people that aren't doing what we're doing and going to, you know, that, that, that these, that these poor souls are just lost. Really what, what we need to do is when we make that break, we have to keep breaking further and further and further until we find ourselves as it were lost in God. And that's the, the essence of the spiritual life. The essence of the spiritual life is union. It's union with God. It's a union between the soul of man and the soul of God. It's a love. God, God loves our soul and we love, or we love God and God loves our soul back. It becomes a, a friendship. It's a, it's a love between friends, which means it's a mutual, uh, it's a mutual love between one and the other. It's, God elevates us in this love. He, what he does is he places love in us, and he finds us lovable because of that. And he loves us, and we love him back. Well, in that, there's union. The link between the union between uh, God and man is linked by love. And you can't have love for God if you don't have love for your neighbor. Do you see? So all the aspects of the of union with God that go deeper and deeper and deeper. So the more we love God, the more we lose our love for the creature, the more we keep turning around to God from every little aspect. Think of all the things that are in our life. And we do the, uh, the adversio ad creaturum. 
uh, and come back to Adeo. Uh, we want to turn our, ourselves away from everything, but we, we've got to slowly do that because we take big steps at the beginning of our conversion, and then we might find ourselves thinking about, I don't know, you know, just the different things, the different attachments that we have and how they wrench on our heart. The sentimental comes in. You wake up, you had a dream that night to remind you of so-and-so or this or that. You want to go. It's the breaking. It's the breaking and the turning away from everything that might keep us from God. Even the things that are good, like our family. Christ says that. They hate him. Now, he doesn't mean hate him because that's, you know, hatred is a, it's a sin against, uh, against this, you know, thou shalt not kill. But we don't hate them in a bad way. We, we, we hate the, what we hate is we, we do, we hate them more than we love them. The hatred means that you do not choose them above God. You love God above all things and would, would easily and willingly walk away from everything, no matter what God asks you to do. It's the taking your son, Isaac, who was promised to you, up the mountain and sacrificing him, or at least knowing God's going to take care of this, but I have to do what he said. But he will, he will, he will provide the sacrifice, right? Probably a modern example would be... Uh... Your son or daughter is having a uh, outside the church wedding, and you got to tell them no. Yeah, you know that that's the downfall of many, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because the human it's human respect, and that would be the hatred. Unless you hate your daughter or your your son more than God, meaning you love God more than your son or daughter. But what they love more than God is the affection of their son or daughter. Mm -hmm. So they rather. They would rather even go to hell than lose the affection of their son or daughter. That, that's a grave thing. And you see it all the time. It's the weakness of men. That's why we pray constantly. We need grace to make this constant conversion. But what we see in St. Francis is somebody who wanted above all else to risk life and limb to make those breaks, to hate, to hate mother and father now, remember what we're saying when we say hate, because somebody's going to be listening to this and they're going to go nuts. But when we, when we say hate to mean, to mean to not choose them over God, mm -hmm. we, we turn, if we turn our back on our mother and our father to choose God, well, we are the manifestation of our love of God is only made, it's only made manifest in our love of our neighbor. So in our turning our back on our mother and our father, it's because it's going to, it's going to allow us to love them more. But to love them properly, because if we love them above God, we don't love them properly and we don't really love them at all. We love them because what they give me, what I what I receive from them. And that's why a mother loves her daughter more than God, because she can't do without the affection from the daughter. So her God's the affection, not God. That's the problem with it, to be able to say, no, I love my daughter and she's getting married outside the church. And that could mean her damnation. I won't participate in her offending my God, whom I love above all things, even above her, because I wouldn't have her without God. It's putting everything into perspective and being able to choose the right. And so St. Francis seeing the right and wanting to gravitate towards the right, that's what led him to, le to lead the most um, radical form of life, so radical that the Pope, Pope Innocent III, one of the greatest popes, a great pope. He thought this is too radical. You, you can't live this. It's just, it's, it's too radical. And then one of the cardinals went back to him and said, holiness, if you say this is too radical, what you're saying is the gospel is not possible to live. And that's when he, our Lord helped him with a dream and he was able to accept St. Francis's life. And look at how many saints there are now that have come from the Franciscan order. I brought up the vocation one a minute ago, well, a couple minutes ago, to especially, I forgot to follow up with the preaching part, the whole Francis line of uh, preach always, but sometimes use words as a yeah. tribute to him. And yet he was a dr dr dynamic preacher. Yeah. Something the modern people get confused that they think he just was playing with the birds and not saying any words. Yeah. And birds, so bunnies, and butterflies. He was in your face. Yeah, I mean, St. Francis, there's, there's an account of a, a law student at Bologna. Bologna had a famous law school. And even today, um, that's really where canon law kind of started up with Graziano. But 
St. Francis passed through Bologna and he preached and there was thousands of people that came out, the learned, the simple, the, um, the housewives, the baker. I mean, everybody was out there. And one of the students talked about it. He was a short little man. He was dirty. He had an old tattered habit on and he captivated everybody. But he didn't say anything. It was like these great, like today you get these great uh, sermons that are, are masterpieces. That wasn't St. Francis. He didn't have that. He didn't do that. He spoke. This is, this is really part of the Franciscan spirituality is to give, to be able to arrive um, with the impact of the faith through simple words, mm-hmm. also through simple concepts, because it, it really isn't complicated. Like the simple example of Brother Ass, I've been finding that absolutely captivates people. This idea of Brother Ass, it's not, it's not a complicated thing. It's a very, very simple thing, but I find you got to talk about it all the time because it's, you know, the people need to be, they need to be assisted in the simplicity of the faith so they can arise, to, they can arrive at the height, the heights of the faith. God in his essence is simple. And we may come out to be very, very complicated because we're actually complicated and God is simple. So our complicatedness, we call simplicity and we call God's simpleness complicated, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So to arrive at holiness, it's very, very simple. Just start living only for God and accept whatever comes from it and know that someday I'm going to die and everything on this earth, no matter how painful or difficult or how much sorrow it, in, it inflicts on me, that all passes away because I know every day when I've had that migraine for two days, the third day comes and I'll have the migraine and I feel great. Well, that, that's the same thing for the whole life. You pass your 80 years and you feel horrible the whole time because that's what happens on earth. And then you die and you have an eternity of, I feel great. Mm-hmm. You're, you can you be immersed in God. That makes it worth fighting through a whole life full of difficulty and suffering and, and sons and daughters throwing themselves into marriages that are invalid and you putting down the line and saying, I'm not going to cooperate in this and whatever else it might be and suffering the the difficulty that comes from that, knowing that uh, I think there's a there's a quote in scripture. It's in it's in twelve. It's in Apocalypse twelve. I think it's at the end of the chapter of uh, chapter twelve in, in Revelation. I might be getting it wrong. I think no, it's in Hebrews. It's in Hebrews, and it talks about chapter twelve of Hebrews, and it says um, ten days. Um, ten days you suffer. I can't remember exactly right now, but 10 days you suffer and then you don't suffer anymore. The 10 days is an, it's a, it's a, it's an even number. So that means it's finite. Mm -hmm. So that finite number, it just shows that we suffer a couple of days here and then, then we don't suffer anymore for those who seek heroically in that conversion, heroically that turning away from the creature and turning towards God. If they live that every day, an example that St. Francis gives us, that's when, we, that's when we arrive. It, it doesn't matter what Brother Ass feels and all the pain that we go through and the, the, our heart-wrenching experiences. But finally, at the end, we arrive at the purity of being immersed in the beauty of God, which is heaven. And that never ends. So 80 years is like a speck. It's like a speck on a map. Whereas eternity, you can't, you can't make a map that holds eternity. Does that make sense? Yeah, I remember some, one priest talking about that saying, uh, was it Cain's uh, first day in hell? And it, it basically be day one is today. It just started for him. Or yeah. The first person yeah, yeah. in hell, it just started for him today. That's how long it took. Right. Right. Not even realistic. Because it's outside of time. Okay. We can't understand outside of time what that means. So, Explain Brother Ass for anybody that may not know. All right. I mean, brother ass is, it's the difference between the flesh and the spirit. So we're a, we're a composition. Uh, man is a spirit and he's a body. Well, because of the fall, our body, and this is why we're so attracted to the things that, uh, of earth that are, that are creatures. All the creatures are concupiscence that came at the fall. Concupiscence is, well, now what we call concupiscence is a disordered 
uh, desire for pleasure. Mm -hmm. Meaning we probably had concupiscence before, but we don't refer to it that as anymore. You, you had, you had pleasure and desire for pleasure, but it wasn't disordered. Now we have a disordered desire for pleasure. The example I always give is like a you got a thing of pizza there. You need two pieces of pizza, but instead you eat half the thing because the pizza is really good. Well, you, you mentioned that to any kids and they all look at you like, he knows exactly what we do. <laughs> yeah, we all do it because pizza tastes really good. So you want to eat half the box, but you don't need half the box of pizza. You need two pieces. Adam and Eve would have had two pieces of pizza. They wouldn't have had half the box of pizza. Well, in our, that's, that's, that's brother ass. Brother ass tells me, no, no, you're going to have, you're going to have six pieces of pizza, but my, my, you know, the, the, the new man inside of me, the baptized man who, who strives for God says, but I know that I only need two pieces of pizza. I'll eat two pieces of pizza and I'll be, I'll be just fine. But then brother ass starts fighting with, with the new man and starts saying, no, no, I want you to eat six pieces because so last time you're going to get pizza. It's going to be Lent's coming. You know, you're not going to get you're not going to get any more pizza. This company's going to go out of business because of the coronavirus. Everything else, and so you better eat half the half the piece of pizza, half the pie of pizza. That's brother ass against the spirit. To get to heaven, now you see this in the the resurrected body. The resurrected body, which we see after the resurrection, and you get a very beautiful account of it in Mary of Agreda. So she talks about it kind of in the theological sense, mm -hmm. but. It becomes um, subtle. It becomes luminous. It, it's able to move agility. It's able to move very, very quickly, whatever else. But those attributes of the risen body come because the soul dominates the flesh. The flesh is really there. And on the final day, when Christ calls us all together and he separates the sheep and the goats from the right and the left, we're actually going to have our bodies. And our bodies will either be glorious because the soul dominates the flesh or it's going to be her her horrendous and it's going to be the, sh the goats where the, the flesh dominates the soul. Now in that, that's the battle. The whole life that we have is for that battle alone. Because people say, God doesn't want you to suffer. God doesn't want you to feel any pain. God doesn't want you. That's all, that's all hogwash. No. Christ wants us to imitate him. And he was the suffering servant. He was a worm and no man is what scriptures refers to him as. We imitate that. The saints have imitated that. If you believe that, you believe nonsense. So we know that we're supposed to live this, this life, not seeking out the pain, the, the difficulty, the whatever. We do penance, but we accept whatever comes our way. and We don't murmur or complain about it. So in doing that, by doing this battle between the flesh and the spirit, the flesh is telling me, complain. The flesh is don't let them speak to you that way. The flesh is telling me, eat more than you should do, drink more than you should do, say more, look at things you shouldn't look at, you desire to see, you desire to hear, you desire to be fulfilled in your senses, where the, the spirit says, you, you need to mortify your senses so that you can grow deeper and deeper in the spiritual life. Now, the flesh is going to rebel against that and say, no, look over here. Look over there. Look this thing up on the Internet. Spend your time watching this. Don't read that book. Don't go and pray. The spirit, if it, if it gives in, it loses each time. And it gets weaker and it gets weaker and it gets weaker. St. Francis knew that Brother Ass had been fulfilled in all of his revelry when he was a youth. Even if he didn't commit mortal sins, he still let him eat lavishly at banquets. He let him wear... Um, fine garments. He, you know, they let, he lived in a luxurious house. So in his later days, they would tell him, you should really, you should really offer yourself a bit more nourishment. And he said, I can't let up on brother ass. I can't let up on him because if you give brother ass just a, you know, if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile is the saying that we use, right? right. So this is the battle. It's a real battle in the spiritual life. It's really, in the end, you could say, it's the only reason we're here. If you want eternity and you want the merit of eternity, we do that. Merit only comes through love. It comes through acts of love towards our neighbor and God. Everything has to be for God, lovingly for him. So by getting this, the 12, you, know, you, get, you get a whole pie of pizza and you'll only eat two pieces and you really want to eat six. And you say, no, you're only going to eat two. And you do that violence to yourself for the love of God, meritorious. Can we throw a cannoli in there for the two slices? <laughs> <laughs>
So that's essentially brother ass. It's, it's the, it's the life. It's the life of the spirit, which would be the new man, the new man who, who attains to God, who, who longs to be in heaven, who is home is in heaven. And then there's brother ass who brother ass is. He, he is the, um, he, he doesn't, he wants you to live here. He wants you to believe that your pleasure, you, you deserve these pleasures in the life here. You, you deserve to take it easy. You deserve to let brother ass sleep in until 12 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, whoever wins the battle determines your eternity. And that's what St. Francis understood. And that's when he made his conversion, he did great violence against brother ass. He didn't let him... He let him be cold. He let him be hungry. Um, he would punish him a little bit. He would make him walk everywhere. Um, so he did these. He did these kind of extraordinary things. We're not called maybe all to do great extraordinary things, but if you go through your day and you think about the little mortifications, like not responding when somebody calumniates you or says something you right in front of your face or, or disrespects you, not saying anything. You know how hard that is. You just can't not say it. You just, you want to say that. If you don't say it, what does it feel like inside? It feels like death. Mm-hmm. It is. It actually is death. You're putting the old man to death. But every time you win that battle, the new man gets stronger and stronger and stronger until you find yourself freed from all those things of the world so that you can live for God. And that's where that union starts getting stronger and stronger before you and God. People always ask me, and I'll just bring this up real quick, just, just so people that are watching will understand a bit more. How do you get to that? If you're not making a meditation, you're not praying and striving to be recollected, that means not allowing all the noise in your head, not allowing all the thoughts to keep running through your mind, but being alone with God. If you're not doing that at least 15 minutes, better an hour every day, you're not, you're not going to arrive. Our, our culture has way too much going on. And so, you know, you come back just from going to, well, the only thing open today is Walmart. You, you go to Walmart to, to pick something up. You come back, you've heard all the music, you've seen a billion people, you were driving down the road, you probably had the radio on at the same time. You haven't had a single thought today where you're able to lift your mind and your heart to God, which is the definition of prayer. Mm-hmm. Time alone with God, recollection, trying to mortify that, lots of time of silence, even when you're in the car, when you're walking around, you don't have to have this things in your ears you don't have to be using your phone all the time to keep yourself busy all of that stuff will keep you attached to the world and when you're attached to the world you're turning your back on god in some way whether it's sinful it's not sinful all right teresa of avila i think says that if you're not doing a mental prayer it's not satan bringing you to hell you're doing it yourself that's right uh, what are the practical ways to develop or to beat brother ass? Uh, something like uh, not hitting the snooze button or things like that. You know, it's the little things in the day. It, it, honestly, the snooze button is a big one for people. And when I talk to kids, <laughs> I always use that example talking to kids and they always look at me like, <laughs> I mean, I'm going to have to get, so set your alarm. And before you go to bed, you, you pray to your guardian angel and you make a pact with yourself, you will never hit the snooze button because it really doesn't help you out anyways. You'll get more and more tired the more you hit the snooze button. But forcing yourself up, what you're doing is you'll immediately hear in your head, no, just five more minutes, you didn't get a lot of sleep, you got to bed a little bit late. You'll hear this dialogue goes on just in a flash of an eye. But to beat brother ass in those instances, you make immediately make the sign of the cross and throw your feet on the floor. Even if you're exhausted, like we get up at 1.30 in the 1230 in the middle of the night, pray. And then you're up again at five. Right. Do that. You know, you're tired sometimes. You're really tired. And so the only way you do it is you get into a routine of always just throwing yourself out of bed, making the sign of the cross. Some days you're so tired, you're bouncing off the walls, but you refuse to do anything but get up because you have to tell your body what to do, not your body tells you what to do. That's one little way to defeat it. And then the list goes on, you know, with what you eat, um, with what you listen to, if you listen to something, uh, what you're going to read, if you're going to, you know, how, how you're going to go about your day. But it's really identifying faults. When I go to work every day, I meet my boss, he says this, I retort back, 
We don't have a good relationship. You know, in your meditations, making resolutions. And you should have a journal for that. The journal is not for writing, writing for an hour during your meditation. The journal is so you can write down after your meditation some kind of resolution. And when you examine your conscience, which you should be doing uh, at least once a day, sometimes twice, before, at least before you go to bed, you examine, did I keep my resolutions today? Was I faithful to what I promised our Lord I would do? Um, am I progressing in this? Did I, did I move backwards? Do I need to reset my resolution? These are the practical things that we need to do every day so that little by little, we're chipping away um, at, at, these, um, at these faults that we have that are keeping us from excelling in the religious or in the, in the spiritual life, in that union with God. Does that make sense? Isn't it the imitation that Christ that says that? Try to get one virtue or one rid one vice a year? Oh, oh, I'm sure. I mean, they, in the imitation of Christ, it probably hits this stuff over and over and over. I mean, that such it's such a rich thing. Most people, if they would just read, you know, bits and pieces of that every morning and meditate on it, that would be sufficient for them to really start growing in holiness. I mean, it's just it, it, every time I look at or read it and I just think of the guys that memorized it, like the little flower or the North American martyrs going these guys memorized that book. And I'm, I'm just trying to read the chapter a day. <laughs> what do you do? Um, a question is uh, from one of the people watching is uh, St. Francis and the Muslims. Did, can, you, can you relate that story just a little bit? Yeah, but I, just to make it quick, they, they, knew, they made a new movie and maybe the person that's watched, I haven't seen the thing, but they've made all of the third order here in America watch this, this piece of trash. And it has to do with, um, it was made by Muslims uh, who used to be, I think they used to be Catholic or Christian in some capacity. And they made this movie and they admit that it was Islamic propaganda. So now they've transformed. This is what you always have to do. You've got to transform the person of St. Francis to make him something else. I think it's called the saint and the sultan, I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. Well, and like I said, they're making the Third Order members watch this. The Third Order Franciscans watch this, so they start getting a new idea. I've had a lot of Third Order members complain about it to me. But in that, they're making it out like you got this, this very wise and compassionate Muslim leader. And it sounds like he probably was a, a pretty good a guy that was, he was disposed mm -hmm. to convert. He really had a great respect for St. Francis. But St. Francis had a love, and we should have a love for anyone, whether Muslim or Jew or pagan or whatever they are. We have, we have a love for anyone who has the ability to receive the grace of God because we want everybody to go to heaven. We don't hate Muslims. There was a crusade going on, and St. Francis visited the camp, and he saw there was great immorality in the camp. And he, he started to preach and help things. And then they, they kind of pulled him aside and said, what are you, you, know, you telling people? Because he, he, he actually received a revelation that they were going to be defeated and everything like that. So he decided, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go convert the, the sultan. I'm just going to go over there and convert him. And the, you know, that, that's, that's nonsense. You're going to die. But he, he, he believed. He, he didn't care if he died. And that's just it. That's, that's the point. The more you live for God, the more you really don't care if you die because all you have waiting for you, someone who lives for God is eternity in heaven. I mean, so he was looking forward to eternity in heaven. He goes across. Uh, I think it was brother Leo that was with him. I might have it. No, it was, uh, I'm forgetting right now, but he went over with one of the brothers and they got beaten and they got taken before the Sultan and he started to preach to the sultan. The sultan had a great respect for him. And then St. Francis just said, well, the first thing the sultan did is he put out a carpet. It was a tapestry that they had stolen from the Christians. They had crosses on. And they put it on the floor to test St. Francis to see if he was going to step on the cross or not come forward. So he would come in to meet the sultan. The sultan called out to him and said, come forward. If he wouldn't come forward because he wouldn't step on the cross, it would be an offense against the sultan for not coming forward. If he would come forward and step on the cross, then he would show himself a non-believer. St. Francis walked forward, stepped right on the cross, and walked up to the sultan. And then the sultan said to him, how is it that you walked forward and stepped right on the image that you all worship or something? And St. Francis said, there were three crosses 
Our Lord was on one, and the other two were for criminals. I stepped on the one for the criminal. <laughs> so, so St. Francis, finally, after talking to him for a while about the faith, he finally said, listen, make a fire. Make a big fire. And choose one of your holiest men, and we'll both walk into the fire. Whoever survives it, that's the one who has the real faith. And so the sultan was like, um, okay, go outside and wait. We'll talk about this. So they went to talk about it. St. Francis went outside, and he talked to the men. None of them were willing to do it, obviously, <laughs> because what are you going to do? They came back, and they weren't willing to take the challenge. But um, St. Francis, they, were willing, they wanted to give him all kinds of gifts and send him on his way. They wanted him to stay there and live with him for a while and whatever else. And St. Francis didn't want any of the gifts. And just said, I want your conversion. I want you to convert. He's like, well, I can't convert. And so St. Francis left. And that's basically the end of the story. Uh, some people say that the Sultan really did want to convert. Some say he did convert later. I don't, I mean, I don't know enough about it to, to be able to answer any of that. But um, the propaganda that's coming out today, it doesn't have anything to do with We We have the same desire today with Muslims as we had at the time of St. Francis. We want the right to go to the Holy Land. We want the right to be able to travel without being having our heads cut off. And we want everyone to convert to Jesus Christ so they can receive grace. The grace is the love of God. And without the love of God in us, we, you're not loved by God in the sense of you do not take, you're not a share. You do not take a share, a, a hereditary share in heaven. You don't become a true son of God. And we want everybody to become an heir to the kingdom of God so they can go to heaven. So it's, it's leaving behind human respect and saying we got to all get along and say, no, we, we, love, we love Muslims because we love all men and we want them to become Christian. However, if it comes to warring, well, people have a right to defend themselves. And that's what, the, that's what basically the Crusades were, is to, to stop this evil spread of a fake doctrine and in, in, in the killing and destroying of Christianity in that part of the world. Yeah, I had to explain that to some college kid one time in Spartanburg. Uh, we were doing a street team evangelization, and he comes up to me and is trying to bloviate about the Crusades. And I go, let me tell you about what the Crusades were. He's a little bit, he was about six inches small, smaller than me, shorter than me. I thought, let me start pounding you into the ground right now. Wouldn't you want somebody to come help you off? And, yeah. yeah. There's the Crusades. <laughs> the Crusades. That's right. Um, St. Francis's a uh, song of St. Francis. I've heard that was written by someone in World War One. Did Francis write that, or was that somewhat something in more modern times? Which song of St. Francis? Uh, let me be an instrument of your peace. The, the... Oh, okay. Well, that's the prayer. That's the prayer that they, they attribute to St. Francis. Um, now. I don't know enough about I, I don't know if I've actually seen that in the writings, but it is attributed to him. At least the words are very beautiful. Mm -hmm. But the, the English melody that we listen to that is kind of it's hard to listen to if, if you grew up with it. That's just that is it's just a new it's a new written kind of format. However, St. Francis did write the Canticle of the Sun. Mm -hmm. And in that he wrote it when he was going half blind. He was living in a shed behind the um, where the sisters where St. Clair lived. And there were rats that shared the shed with him. And, but he, he one day wanted to go on a walk. He was really sick. I mean, he was, he was on the point of death. And he just his heart was so bursting for the love of God, he wrote this Canticle of the Sun. And the Canticle of the Sun, he told the brothers to write a melody to it and to go take it wherever they went to sing this to people because they wanted people to see. Because we, we are surrounded by creation. So St. Francis understood that everything that was created was created by God for us, to help us to better know God. It's not to love creation in and of itself. It's to love God because of what God gave us. And so he sings the canticle basically of creation, seeing that we were created just like everything else was created. So we have something we have something in common with all the things that are around us. And like St. Bonaventure later, you know, carrying that thought goes on to say is that nature is an open book for the proof of the existence of God. And so by reading that book of nature, we're able to arrive at God because he wrote it. 
And this is St. Francis just had a deep appreciation for it because of his love for God. He wrote this beautiful canticle. And even that canticle today, we're actually trying to, you can find it online in, uh, in English, and it's really hard to listen to. I mean, the, not the words, but the, the melody. It's just one of those 60 melodies. It just it makes your skin crawl. So we're trying to rewrite it. We want to get something where we can actually, because the words are actually, they're magnificent. And it would be beautiful if they had a, med, a, medieval, a medieval melody to it, maybe with a flute, or, you know, kind of how they did it in the medieval time. It would be beautiful to be able to go around singing that again, because it really would, it would lift your heart. Um, but that that that's a true song that St. Francis did write. Now, I'll, I'll leave the, the books that Tam publishes underneath that uh, on St. Francis, but a couple off the top of your head that you know of that are must-reads. Well, St. for St. Francis, I mean, the must-reads would probably be, you can get them now, the, the critical editions, the writings of St. Francis, mm -hmm. and the writings of St. Francis, must-reads. I mean, these are things you meditate on. The Little Flowers, very beautiful. The Three Companions, uh, that would be something to read. Uh, the Life of Blessed uh, Blessed Thomas of Chilano, he was the one that, he knew St. Francis, he was a companion, and so he was commissioned by the Pope to write the, the first and second life, and so to read those. But in most especially, the life of, um, the major life of St. Francis by St. Bonaventure, magnificent work. Um, those, those would be the, those would probably be the primary things I would say uh, to read. The, 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 the little flowers, they almost sound, they almost sound absurd sometimes when you read them. But I've been a Franciscan for a while and that kind of stuff happens in friaries, just the weirdest stuff. So I believe all of it. I just believe all of it. So the little flowers, the companions, the writings of St. Francis, uh, St. Bonaventure and Blessed Thomas of Chilano. Those would be the, 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 the must-reads. Okay. Again, I'll have uh, your uh, website underneath, but uh, can you give us the website name anyways and just tell us a little bit what we can find on it? Yeah, so it's Marion Friars Minor, uh, Marion Friars Minor, and it comes from, it, it's Marion because as St. Bonaventure writes in Chapter 3 of the, the Major Life, he refers to Our Lady as well, he refers to St. Francis, who had a deep devotion to Our Lady. He would go to the Portiuncula. The Portiuncula is a little portion, that little uh, the, the Our Lady of the Angels. And he repaired that church, and he would go there to pray. And he prayed incessantly, he says, to Our Lady that she would, take, that, that, that she would become his advocate. And when she finally accepted and became his advocate, it says that she conceived in St. Francis the fullness of the evangelical truth. Now, the evangelical truth is the fullness of, of Christ, yeah. of the life of Christ and how to live the life of Christ. This is, this is the Franciscan charism. And she brought it to fruition. She, she conceived it and she brought it to birth in St. Francis. That's the vocation of St. Francis was to live the life of Christ, the early apostles. And they did it so much so that they found that the people referred to Christ or St. Francis as the risen Christ. That's why it's Marian, because you don't, it, the, friend, the Franciscan tradition is Marian. That, that's the way it is. It's a Marian order. And people, people have lost sight of that. So that's why it's Marian Friars Minor. The website, you'll just find the basic stuff for, you can find the rule on there. I do have some talks on there for a consecration, um, a nine day consecration. It's what, we did a nine day preparation for the Immaculate Conception. And I put the talks there in preparation for a consecration according to St. Maximilian Cole, because the Franciscan, it's a Franciscan consecration. It's from the great doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, which is a Franciscan doctrine. Um, and then you can also find talks I gave at a local parish on, um, on the mass. You, you also put that up, but it's a, it's a theological course that I gave to lay people. The first part just kind of talk about the theology behind the sacrifice and liturg liturgy, what it means. And then we start getting into the mass and the things that you start to see in there. And most especially you see the Latin mass, obviously, because that's where you're going to find, um, you know, that, that's what goes all, that's what Pius V said goes all the way back to the apostles. So you can't really understand the new mass unless you understand the old mass. So we're basically talking about the old mass in there, but we do make a lot of references and people ask questions about the new mass. So there's a, there's a little bit of everything. 
Okay. So there's all contact information. And if you ever want to help the friars out, there's a you, you can always help the friars out too. So that's that. Amen. Hopefully people will do on that. Again, everything will be underneath in the show notes description section. And Friar Anthony, thank you for your time. God bless you. Thank you. Talk to you later.